spoke on righteousness, we spoke on peace, today we're going to speak on joy. And it's interesting how you'll look something up, and you've heard it taught one way for so long, but then God just opens it up a little bit deeper. We call it the onion. You peel back another layer of the onion, and it's just amazing what He, what he shows you. So the first week we spoke on righteousness, and we learned that righteousness is not living good. It's not about you making good decisions. Righteousness is actually making God decisions. It's going to the Father and saying, what is your heart in this? What is your intent in this? What is your desire for whatever I'm facing? That's how we make decisions. We talked about how Adam was a righteous man before he even knew what good and evil was. He wasn't making good decisions to become righteous or good decisions to, to be righteous. He just was living for God. He was fulfilling the, the desires of the Father. We talked about this. We spray the yard for weeds. And my son gets up one morning after I've sprayed the yard, and I'm at work, and he looks outside, and he's like, I think I should mow the yard. It's all raggedy. It, it, it's, it's a mess. I think my dad would like it if I mowed the yard. And he mows it. And then I come home, and I'm like, who mowed the yard? I just spent all that money on the chemicals and they needed time to set in. What, what's going on? And I go in and he's like, I mowed it. I thought it would please you. Like, I like, I, I like your intentions, but you didn't come seek me. You didn't come seek my heart for the yard that day. I would have told you to wait till the next day. So instead of making a righteous decision based on his father's heart, he made an unrighteous decision based on his knowledge of what is good and evil. And that's what righteousness is. Righteousness is not about good and evil, right and wrong. Righteousness is about, God, what do you want? What's your heart? What's your desire for this? And, and to bring that out, you can read books that will tell you what's right and everything. And people will tell you what's right and wrong. But oftentimes, people say your options are A, B, or C. And God says, D, none of the above. And says, I have a way for you that's different. It doesn't look like what's been done before. It doesn't make sense. When we did the message on righteousness with the uh, baby that had passed and the two mothers, King Solomon, well, he, he said, well, we'll cut the baby in half. And the one mom said, yes, cut the baby in half. The other one said, no, I'd rather the baby live with somebody than to be cut in half. Option A was give it to her. Option B was give it to the other one. Option C was give it to the priest or whatever it would have been at that time. Solomon said, no, this is the option. I will find out who the mother is because a mom would never sacrifice her kid. But a, somebody that's grieving and hurt would say, yeah, split it because she already lost hers. And so that was God's righteous choice because in the court's eyes, there would have been other options that would have never been, let's pull out the sword, let's split the baby. But God always has a different plan. God has none of the above. Let's do it my way. And there's always restoration in his way. So we learned last week, we started talking about peace. And we learned that the English word for peace is probably a bad translation of the Greek and Hebrew. It's actually shalom. It's the provision of God. It's the manifestation of God. It's, it's everything God is. Really what it is is Shalom is an expression of God's love towards you. It's Him showing you He loves you. It's peace in your life. It's protection in your life. It's provision in your life. We learn that righteousness, as the scriptures say in Psalms, righteousness brings life. Life is that shalom. When we make decisions based on the Father's heart, God, what do you want for me? God, what do you want? What is your intent for this situation? What, what do you want me to do with my money? instead of what I think is a good decision for my money. That's righteousness. And when we walk according to God's heart, it produces life. It cannot produce death, the scripture says. So righteousness produces shalom. Righteousness produces the provision of God, the fullness of God. And we learned that peace, as Bill Johnson puts it, Peace is not the absence of something. Peace is the presence of something. 
It's not the absence of a tribulation or a trial or a difficult situation or even a good one. Peace is the provision within it. We talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego where peace wasn't the absence of fire. Peace was Jesus within the fire, was the protection from getting burnt. We talked about the book of Acts where they were, they were prophesied of a famine. Peace wasn't, oh, there's no more famine. We have peace. No, peace was the provision within the famine. And that's what shalom is. Shalom is the provision regardless of what we're going through. There's provision. It's the 1,000 people die at my side, 10,000 at my other, but it doesn't harm me. Peace is the United States is going through this and that financially, and we're having this economic collapse, and we're out of toilet paper, but I have toilet paper. It's the big and the little things. It's everything. It's straight shalom. It's in that sweet spot of God. It's God saying, I love you. And then this week we're going to talk about what joy is. And what we've been seeing is righteousness produces shalom, and the results of shalom is joy. So when God shows up, what's there not to be joyful about? So what is joy? The Webster's Dictionary defines it as an emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of, of possessing what one desires. So joy could be translated the delight of the Lord. A state of happiness or felicity, which is bliss, to experience great pleasure, delight, which is rejoice. So to sum it up, joy, even just from a worldly dictionary, is delight, bliss, and to rejoice. In the Greek, it literally means cheerful, to be calm, to delight, joy, gladness, and it's to, it's to the joy received from you and the cause or an occasion for joy. Now this is the part that when I'm sitting here studying this, the root word for the word joy and the root word for grace is actually the same Greek word, the G5463 if you're looking it up in the Strong's. So to me, it's crazy. We always talk about grace and truth, you know, our grace and mercy. All these things that God gives us by the grace of God. And joy, we, talk, we usually think of these separate. But if you look at the root word, it's the same root word. And so I'm going to flip. So the joy, it's Kyra, C-H-A-R-A. Grace is Kairos, C-H-A-R-I-S. And the root word is Cairo, C-H-A-I-R-O. That's how like closely related they are. When I started doing the only reason I found grace is I knew the word for grace. I've studied it out before. I'm like, this joy word and the root word look almost identical to grace. So I go look at them, and they both point to the same thing. So the root of joy and grace is founded on the same principle. So if I have the grace of God that's working in my life, it comes from the same foundation of joy, which is, an, to me, that was an exciting thing because the root word means to rejoice, to be cheerful, to be joyful, to be glad, to rejoice exceedingly, to do well, to thrive. And God's speed and greeting and spare. So it's used as a greeting or a farewell. But man, it's to be well, it's to thrive. So you look at what peace was last week, shalom. It meant all the provision you need. It meant perfect. It meant everything, nothing missing. Everything's whole. And now joy, we look at it. It means to be cheerful, to be joyful, to be well, to thrive. And then the Hebrew word, it's simple, joy, joy of God, gladness, glad results, pleasure, glee, rejoice, and happy. I struggled with this this last week, trying to, trying to really pinpoint God, what is joy, Lord. And it's really simple. But I struggled with trying to like define it. It's the joy of the Lord. It starts up here. What does that look like? What does that mean? But what I started seeing was righteousness leads to shalom and shalom leads to joy. You can't have joy without shalom in your life. Without the shalom of God active manifesting in your life, you can't have joy. But you can't have shalom if you don't have righteousness. When you walk in righteousness, it produces shalom, which 
brings about the joy of the Lord and it fulfills the kingdom. Really get back to righteousness for a moment. So it is God's heart. If you were to break down God's heart into one word, what would it be? Love. Love. It's going to be love. God's heart, it says in 1 John 4, God is love. In Galatians 5, the fruits of the Spirit, the Passion Translation says, love in all its varied aspects. And it says joy, peace, all these things. Righteousness is founded in love. And a lot of people say, man, God loves Reggie. God's faithful to Reggie. I can believe it for other people. A lot of people will pray for other people and confess the righteousness over them. But if I actually say God is faithful and God loves and God is righteous to Jason, most people stu struggle with righteousness and how God is faithful to them. We're comfortable praying and believing God's going to bless other people. But for me to experience the shalom, which is produced by righteousness, I have to understand righteousness. I have to understand his love, his heart, is for me as much as every one of you. Because if I don't believe that, I'm not going to have shalom or peace in my life. There's no way it's going to manifest without me truly believing that God loves me. That God loves Serge, that God loves Robert, Nikki, Ben, Nathaniel, Joel, I could go on. You have to know he loves you. And I know the more people we sit with, people are like, I understand. God is good. I've seen God be good to blank, 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 and blank. But what about me? God hasn't done this for me. God hasn't done this. I'm still walking through this. Most people don't believe he's good to them. I can look at everybody else. I can look at the Facebook highlights and say, look how good they are. When you go spend a week with them, you'll be like, okay, they walked through some stuff to get there. We've judged them from their highlight reel versus understanding. They're walking through stuff too. But we have to get the understanding that righteousness is something I have to believe he does for me. Because I, I want to have righteousness and I want to have shalom for myself. And you know when I have that? It affects everybody around me. And so righteousness produces shalom. The result of shalom is joy, therefore fulfilling kingdom. So if I understand I am righteous, I'm going to walk in the shalom peace of God, which is a full provision. When I have that and I don't have to worry about my provision, what happens? You're going to be joyful. Yeah. And when that happens, what happens? People will see that. Whatever Jesus was going through, people were attracted to him, wasn't, weren't they? They were attracted to him because of why? He didn't act like the world. He was always walking in a place of peace, which changed the situation. And you know when somebody's in peace or when they're in chaos, isn't it? You can, you can walk into the room and you can sense what's going on in the room. And that's one of the things. We have to get make sure you understand righteousness is for you. For every one of you. And when you walk in that, you're going to see the fruit of peace or shalom. And then that's when we start to see joy fulfilling the kingdom. You know, I've had conversations with a couple of you. Like you pray for other people and see some crazy manifestations. And then you got a little cough that just won't leave. It's accepting that. No, I'm, I, can, I can walk in that too. I can have that too. Last week we talked about how I struggled that God cares just as much about my physical world as he does about the spiritual. He cares just as much about my outside as he does my inside. I've heard it preached the opposite, like he really don't care about the outside as much. But he equally cares for it. And I think that's important to understand because it makes you realize he cares that I have a cough. He cares that my air conditioner doesn't work. He cares that I got bad tires on my car. Like he cares about those things and he wants to provide for them. Why? Simply because he loves you. He cares that Reggie wants a new Bible. Does he need one? I don't know. Probably not. But God wants to give it to him. Why? Because he loves them. Doesn't have to be a need. I love my kids. It, it bothers me when Adam doesn't ask for stuff. I want to bless Lena just because I want to bless Lena. Not because she needs something. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. 
Psalms 119.11. I'm just going to drive this home with a couple of scriptures. It says, Your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. It's his provision. It's his shalom. The testimonies, they are the rejoicing of my heart. It produces joy. Psalms 126.3 says, He did mighty miracles, and we are overjoyed. I'm just starting to show you a pattern that I started to see. That the joy of the Lord is tied to the shalom of God, to His provision, to His miracles, to His testimonies. Proverbs 10.28 says this, The hope of the righteous brings joy. When we see God move in our lives, I've gotten to the place in my life where I know, I know this beyond a shadow of a doubt. No matter what I face, He's there. There's an answer for it. That's my hope. I know it. You cannot convince me I've seen too much. I've seen Him come through too much. He's always going to be there. He's always going to provide. There will always be shalom. I could always go deeper in it, but I always know there is always shalom in my life. That's where my hope comes from. Matthew 25, 21 says this. It says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Enter into the joy of the Lord. What's he talking about? Making you ruler over many things? See, he's given to you. It's manifested shalom, the provision. I'm making you ruler over much. Enter into the joy of the Lord. His provision is tied to joy. We know that. When he shows up, that's when joy shows up. What I started to see is there's two aspects to joy. When I was trying to put a definition to joy, I, I kept messaging Jason. I messaged a few of you guys just trying to figure out what is it? Lord, give me a picture of what it is. And as Jason was speaking to me, I said, give me your thoughts on joy. Just lay it all out what you got so far. And as he's speaking in the middle of it, I heard, it's the Father's overflow expression of His love for you. Shalom is His expression of His love for you. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that I love you. Joy is the overflow expression of it. It's the, not only do I love you, but I'm in love with you. It's God's infatuation for you. It's His, he's not, He not only loves you, He's crazy for you. It's like I can provide for my wife, make sure she's fed, make sure she has a house, make sure she has a car. But the overflow of that is, hey, wake up. I'm ready to be with you. Why are you sleeping in? Let's hang out. It's when she's sitting on the couch next to me, I'm like, hey, you want to do something today? What? Let's go to Memphis. It's an overjoy of my love for her. It's the over the top. It's, I not only love you, I'm absolutely crazy about you. And I'm going to show it. God not only loves you, He shows it. But He not only loves you, He's in love with you, and He wants to show it. You guys know I love Song of Solomon, especially in the Passion Translation. And I quote some of these scriptures a lot, but I'm going to read a few of them to you that I put on here this morning. Song of Songs 1-6 I want, to, I want to show you a picture of how over-the-top crazy He is for us. When I read it, I see a conversation between Christ and the church. Or between Christ and you. It's a conversation between you and Jesus. And so, this is us speaking to Jesus. Please don't stare in scorn because of my dark and sinful ways. Later on it says, I have not tendered to the, to the vineyard within me. So it's saying, I'm sinful. I'm not worthy. I'm dark. I'm dry. I've not tended to, to your ways very well. I've not tended to what you've given me very well. I've not done a good job at what you've given me. And look at what Jesus' response is. Listen, my radiant one. If you ever lose sight of me, just follow in my footsteps where I lead my lovers. Come with your burdens and your cares. Come to the place near the sanctuary of my shepherds. My dearest one, let me tell you how I see you. You are so thrilling to me. 
That's a joy. That's an overflow expression of His joy for you. Is that even though you're not doing well, even though you think you're a screw up, He's like, come on, let's go. You're radiant. You're thrilling to me. Let's go have some fun. I love you. Song of Songs 2.8 says this. The bride speaking, us. Listen, I hear my lover's voice. I know it's him coming to me, leaping with joy over the mountains, skipping in love over the hills that separate us, to come to me. Now he comes closer, even to the places where I hide. Even when I'm hiding, kind of like Adam. Even when I'm hiding, he comes to me. He gazes into my soul, peering through the portal as he blossoms within my heart. It's God not only does he love you, he's in love with you. It, it's an over expression of his love for you. That's what joy is. Here in the Father's heart. And then the shalom of God being expressed. Zephaniah 3.17 says this. The Lord your God is in your midst. The Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. As we've said many times here, we sing worship songs to the Lord. We talk about His presence coming to us. But He's singing songs to us right here. He will rejoice over you with singing. He sings songs to us like we sing songs to Him. We talk about how awesome it was when God showed up in the service. They're doing the same thing. Man, Serge showed up last night. Did you feel how strong His presence was? That's how heaven speaks about us. That's how God speaks about you. It's both ways. It's not just one way. It's deeper. So the second aspect of joy is that overflow expression of His love for us produces in us an overflow expression of our love for the Father. When you're pouring into your wife, not just going to work and providing her needs, but when you start pouring the, the joyful part where like you're bringing flowers home and you're like, let's go to dinner and let me take you on vacation, that produces joy in her. That's going to make her blossom and come alive. That's exactly the second aspect of joy in our lives. The joy of the Lord produces joy to the Lord. And that's the part. It's the Ephesians 3.20 aspect. You can provide everything for somebody and they're going to be happy. She's provided for. There's a peace and provision. But if I started buying her flowers every week, there's going to be a joy that's above just the regular provision. Uh, and you can see I don't do that. So as I'm saying it, but having provision, there's a peace. Hey, we're, we're secure. One of the words for shalom was security. But if I start going above and getting her flowers, being more diligent in different aspects, you know what? That's the overabundance. That's that joy. That's that overflow. Because Ephesians 3.20 in the Passion Translation, Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all things. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all with his, for His miraculous power constantly energizes you. That's what we're talking about. Having security, that's good. We all want that. But that overflow, that next step, that exceedingly abundantly rejoicing lifestyle is what we're talking about, is that overflow of love. That's, that's what it comes down to. Not just surviving and having just enough. God wants us to thrive. Yeah. And that's the overflow of joy. When you're thriving, there's a difference about how you carry yourself than when you're just surviving. Yeah. And God provides and you're taking care of. He get, takes care of all of our needs. We shall not need anything. But He also wants to take care of your wants. Yeah. He, he wants to make sure He takes care of body, soul, and spirit. The thing about righteousness, peace, and joy, it's not a, a spiritual thing only. It's not a soulish thing only or a body thing. 
It's body, soul, and spirit. He cares about every aspect of who we are. That's what he cares about. It's not just one aspect, and it's not just enough for you to get by. Yep. We have a lot of enough getting along Christians. And right now I'm going to say I'm in that boat. I want to see the joy of the Lord in the exceeding abundance where he gives me the desires of my heart, the wants of my heart that come from him to have even greater. And we, we've met with some people, and it's not wrong to desire a nicer place. It's not wrong. A lot of people say it's wrong for this and that. It's not about that. If he's blessing you and you're doing the will of God and he gives you something nice, I know people that say, nope, that's not for me. But he says, I'm giving it to you. My heart is for you to have this. This gentleman here I know desires to have a house, and the Lord's already showed him what that house is for. How often it's going to be used, what it's going to be used for. So him getting a nice house already has a purpose. That's above and beyond, not just getting by. He wants to bless you exceedingly with his love. That's what love does poured out for us. I'm going to jump to Psalms 51, 12. It says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and renew a right spirit within me. So joy was restored to us when we received Jesus. We became a new spirit. All things became new. Everything became brand new. Body, soul, spirit, flesh, world, everything. And now we have the overflow expression of God's love manifested to us in every way. So He not only loves us, but He's in love with us. So when we realize, when you look at salvation... As Jason has mentioned many times, when you look at salvation, there was no stone untouched. It wasn't just that he made your spirit alive. It wasn't just that you're going to heaven. It was no stone un untouched. He changed literally everything. Actually, he changed even the way the world is producing and moving and functioning. He changed the literal universe changed when Jesus showed up. There was a deterioration happening. Sin was destroying the world, and he turned that around. A restoration started beginning. It's almost like it's doing this. Jesus showed up, and it started going the opposite direction. And we're still in that process of restoration. But there's no, no stone unturned. Everything. You have access to absolutely everything. There's nothing he didn't do. And when you realize what salvation actually brought, that I am a, a new man... I live in a new world. Restoration is coming through me, through the kingdom. It brings that joy because you realize there's nothing he hasn't done. There's nothing you can face that it's not already taken care of. There's nothing you can't face that's going to take you out. Nothing can take you out. As he's talking, and to bring it all around, Jesus came and he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. It didn't say it's coming in 2,000 years. The kingdom of God is at hand. Then what happened? The Holy Spirit came and the kingdom of God did what? The Holy Spirit in us is God in us is what? It's within us. So these things that we talk about, that restoration, it's at hand now. It's not a future thing. For, for the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. They are a now thing. They are for us today. It's not a future thing. Because the kingdom is within us. The kingdom is now. We're not waiting for some event. And then what, what's the issue? So if the kingdom's within us, and the kingdom is now, but we're not seeing it, what's the issue? He's waiting for what? The manifestations of the sons of God. It's He's waiting for us to manifest heaven on earth. He's waiting for us to manifest kingdom, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in everything we do. Now he's saying, manifest it on earth. Bring heaven to earth. And that's the restoration. He's actually did everything. He's waiting for us, the body. He's the head. Us, the body, to manifest. Because we're the part that touches the earth. And so that's the aspect where he restores everything. It's coming back to the restoration 
And for right now, it's waiting for us to manifest. Each and every one of us to manifest in our world, to bring righteousness to our world, to bring peace to our world, to bring joy to our world. Like Jason said, we are to minister righteousness, peace, and joy to the earth. That's what we do. But how can I minister something to the earth if I don't walk in it? it just, I just absolutely can't. I can't minister righteousness. I can't minister God's heart to the world and His intent for this world if I don't even know what it is. I've got to have a relationship. And then I've got to learn to walk in it in my own life. If I can't walk in it in my own life, how am I going to help Charlie walk in it? It's just not going to happen. If I don't have the shalom of God active in my life, how am I going to produce God's provision in the earth? Jesus feeding 5,000 people. He knew God provided for, he saw God. He saw the shalom of God in his life. It's the reason he was able to minister to, to the world. And the same with joy. You can't minister joy to the world if you don't have that joy in your life, if you don't experience that. It all starts with righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The rivers of living water flowing through you, as Jesus spoke about. Those rivers flow from Eden through the garden, which is you, into the world. But a lot of times we have, it's dumping into us, but we start creating these dams where it's like maybe only a little bit of water is getting through. Not all of it's getting through. We're only, we're only seeing it in our soul. Oh, I got inner peace, but I don't have physical peace in my world. I, it's complete chaos. No, he wants it for your spiritual and the physical equally. He cares about it equally. We got to quit thinking that he doesn't care about our physical. He does just as much. He wants you blessed body, soul, and spirit. It says that he has quickened your mortal bodies. And those rivers, when you study about the rivers, as we said in the garden, when they went out into the world, they split out into every way. And it ministers to the world. But what we do is it dumps in and we want to keep it right here. We want to keep everything in and that water becomes stagnant. But it's supposed to be a river flowing into you and then a, that river flowing into the world. But it starts with us. We have to walk in it in order to be able to give it to other people. But what he's saying is this is God pouring into us. This little plateau is us. I've been where water's flowing and how many people we try to build dams? Because we think... It's coming to me. I need this. I need this. So we dam it off so we don't, we don't care about the community. We're worried about ourselves. And so I started looking up beaver dams. If you've ever seen a real beaver dam, they can make some crazy. But if you notice, when you block it up, what happens back here? It becomes stagnant. God, he's overflowing. What do we do? Sometimes we start getting righteousness, peace, and joy. We get a little money. We go, oh, I'm going to start building my wall. I'm going to build my dam because I want to hold more for me. And he's saying, if I can get it to you and I, you release it to the world, it's this picture. This is what it's called to be. He's just pouring out. It talks about rivers of living water flowing in you. And then there's also a talk about the well springing up. He wants to feed us both ways and say, give it to my world. Give it to everybody that you encounter. That's what he wants for us. He wants us to have more than enough. In this area, it's a plateau. You can have fun. You can swim. You can do everything you want. And he says, I still have more for you. I still have more where you can let it go out. And all these people down here are nourished. And then, you know, there's you. And then, and then waterfall after waterfall, you'll just see him pouring out blessings, peace, righteousness to everybody. And as we look at that, I'm going to read one scripture it's 2 John 1, 12 in the Passion Translation. Although I have many more subjects I'd like to discuss with you, I'd rather not include them in this letter. But I look forward to coming and visiting, speaking to you face to face. For being together will complete our joy. Joy, it's that overflow expression. If we live the beaver life, we do not experience the fullness. What's it say? It's greater to give than to receive. It's greater for me to pour out because there's blessings from God from it. For being together completes my joy. You're going to have joy when you have provision and you're able to just bless people. When you're able to say, hey, 
And everybody thinks when I say bless people, it means I'm giving you money. No. It could be a hug. It could be a smile, a handshake. If I give somebody a 20, they're going to spend it, and that, that, that's fleeting. But I've had people remember a hug when they were down. They're like, you know what? That's what matters. That joy, when you share it, and there's times it is financial. But most of the time, are you willing to give your time? Are you willing to put yourself out and just love on somebody when other people have cast them out? Are you willing to just let your life be an open waterfall to just pour out? Because when you're, he's pouring out, he's filling you from the top and bottom. You're not worried about is there enough because where did we start if i understand god is faithful god loves me he says he'll never forsake me i have more than enough i never have to re worry about the source do i because he's god he's faithful to jason and so when i live from that place i'm not worried about damning up what he gives me because i know if I'm faithful to do what he said, if I'm faithful to deliver and seek his heart's desires, he's going to continue to pour out the peace. He's going to continue to pour out the joy. And it becomes this overflow where you just get in the rivers and you just flow and you keep going and he keeps coming and you're, you see his faithfulness more and more. And that's where we actually started with that tongue. We had prayed for something when we were setting the groundwork for Breakaway Kingdom Hub. And so Serge prayed, and he said, in Jesus' name, well, you'll give us an answer. As soon as he did that, I'm like, here's the answer. It's judges. And how do we set up our structure? So there's accountability. There's true accountability. Not, not just this idea of covering, because we have one covering, is Jesus. But mm -hmm. we have accountability. Yep. And there it was. So we were praying for something on it was Friday. We're like, okay, God, what is your true heart for this? Because we were walking through something like, we were like, we could do this, we could do this. And we finally just go, Lord, what is your heart? What is your desire in this situation? Because option A hasn't went well. Option B doesn't look like it's going well. Option C kind of looks like it's going to end like the rest. Lord, what is your desire? And then Serge shares something, and I share some, a vision I seen a while ago, and he kind of interprets it, and we're like, wow. There's our answer. So that's when... All of a sudden, we're like, we're praying for finances because right now we're moving in this. And then that's when I got that tongue, which was all about joy. But that's God's faithfulness. He was faithful on revealing how to set up the structure. He was faithful Friday on giving us a plan to deal with the situation that needs resolved. And he's going to be faithful on showing us what kingdom finances is. And he's going to continue to be faithful. And I know that. I'm not blocking up what it is. And you know what? We just shared our foundational documents with other people. Because guess what? He gave it to us. We're going to give it freely. And they modify it to what God puts on their heart. And it just becomes one of those. Because you know what? He's going to keep giving us everything we need. And so we're going to keep sharing it. Yep. And just pouring it out. You guys know I love Genesis. My favorite book. Favorite book of the Bible. And it lays out, right away, it lays out intent for man. And if you go to Genesis 2... Something I noticed a couple weeks ago, it's, it's laid out in sections. And it's laid out in righteousness, peace, and joy. It's the way we were supposed to live. It's the intent. It's the way. It's God's heart. This is how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to go to Him. Lord, what do you want? As Jamie Winship says, Lord, what do you want me to know in this situation? And what do you want me to do? It's going to the Father and saying, what is your heart for this? And when we step into that, when we walk things out, then the provision of God shows up. Life shows up, as the Bible says. Righteousness produces life. And in it, there's no darkness at all. And then from there, the joy of the Lord pops up. When we first started this, one of the first messages was, every man desires three things. Every man desires to be right with God. They don't want to die and not be right with God. I don't care who you are. I, I got to see a man on his deathbed that worked with my dad who was in the new age and, and did not like Jesus. But a few days before he was getting ready to meet the Lord, he made sure he was right. 
Every man wants to know they're right with God. Every man wants righteousness. Every man wants peace. Everybody wants a peaceful life. Everybody wants to be provided for in life. And every man wants to be happy. Nobody wants to go through life unhappy. The foundations of the United States. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Like that's what men want. And God lays it out. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom. He lays out. He fulfills the desire in every man. He fulfills that for us. It's there. The answer is right there. It's the way we're supposed to live. We just as we've been going through this, we've had a working rewrite of Romans 14, 17, as he showed us what righteousness, peace, and joy is. So for the kingdom of heaven is God's heart of love expressed towards us so that we will have complete provision and security. And that's the Shalom part. To the point we rejoice with gladness as an overflowing expression of God's love to the world. You can see righteousness being God's desire, God's love. Peace being God's provision, which is God's expression of His love for us. And joy being God's overflowing expression of His love for us. And that's what, for the kingdom of God, is righteousness, peace, and joy. That's His expression. That's His love poured out for us. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of love in all the aspects of it for each and every person. Nothing left. No shame, no guilt, no judgment. He's paid for it all. When you accept Him, He swipes the slate clean. And a lot of us, even once we've accepted Him, we've only said it's an eternal promise. But He says it's a promise for today. He's wanting you to receive the blessings of His work on the cross, of His resurrection, ascension, and seatedness today for your body, soul, and spirit. Now, don't wait until death comes. Experience the kingdom of God today. So Matthew 6, 25. Says, the pastor says, This is why I tell you to never be worried about life. For all that you need will be provided, such as food, water, clothing. Everything your body needs. Isn't there more to life than a meal? Isn't, there, isn't your body more than clothing? Consider the birds. Do you think they worry about their existence? They don't plant or reap or store it for you, yet the Heavenly Father provides them each with food. Aren't you much more valuable to your Father than they? So which one of you, by worrying, can add anything to your life? And why would you worry about your clothing? Look at all the beautiful flowers of the field. They don't work or toil, and yet... Not even Solomon, all his splendor was robed in beauty like one of these. You know, you, you don't realize what you just brought out. Thank you for stepping out in that. Because this is what it is. Sir just talked about it. We are, we're in the seventh day. We are in the day of rest. And Judah steps out, and the scripture is, why do we worry about all this stuff? He's given us righteousness. He's given us peace. He's given us joy. But we worry about everything that Judah, you're 13, right? 12. 12. Can look at a tree and say, it doesn't worry. God provides it. It sprouts. Everything else in nature automatically reproduces. And we worry about everything we do. And he said, aren't you more valuable than the lily? Now, my lily is pretty high. The lily flower, just to clarify. <laughs> Clarifying that. Aren't you much more valued to the Father than they? And they don't worry about it. When Christ did it, He restored us back to the day of rest. Read it. We were created on the sixth day, and He rested with us on the seventh. And we were in rest with Him. There was not toil or anything till sin came. So what did Christ do? He did away with sin. So He did away with toil and striving. We are now in the place of rest back with Him. He says it. Listen to it. Aren't you much more valuable to your father than they? And we look at flowers and go, wow, they're so beautiful. But we look in the mirror and say, I'm trash. I have this wrinkle. I have this. I'm missing hair. I have this pimple. And we do this. We call ourselves trash. But we'll look at his creation and say it's beautiful. And what we're the valuable creation.
aren't you much more valuable to your father than they? So which one of you, by worrying, can add anything to your life? And why would you worry about the clothing? Look at the beautiful flowers of the field. They don't work or toil. And yet not even Solomon in all his splendor was robed in beauty like one of these. So if God has clothed the metal with hay, which is here for such a short time, then dries up, then dried up and burned, wouldn't he provide for you the clothes you need? You of little faith. So then, forsake your worries. Oh, Lord, we thank you that people are forsaking their worries tonight. They walk out of here with a peace. They do not take their worries and anxieties. They lay them at your feet right now. Because you're more valuable than lilies, the flowers, the trees. They don't worry. And we say we won't worry. We won't carry the anxiety out with us. Why would you say, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For that is what unbelievers chase after. Doesn't your Heavenly Father already know these things? Your body requires? And one of my favorite verses. So above all, constantly seek God's kingdom. Then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything is yours. Seek first. Seek first. Seek first. Seek first righteousness, peace, and joy, and you will have an overflow that will not be stopped. And the world will run you and say, what's different? It's not going to be what you post on Facebook. It's not going to be what you drive. It's going to be you're different. You, Charlie, you. You're the manifest of the gods on this earth, and you have a unique call for the veterans. You're there for a purpose. Don't let anybody tell you different. You sow life to them people. They need it. They've seen stuff. You've seen stuff. Let your words be healing. Let your words be oil and gladness to every situation. Seek first this kingdom and all this will be added. And when you seek first this kingdom, when they're added, keep seeking first and don't let them become your idol. Because I've been there where I was seeking him and things came. And I started seeking more of this. And I, I had a fall. And he's brought me back to where I could say, we're keeping our eyes on him. No matter what comes, our eyes are on him. We're not going to let the things that he blesses with, the bonuses, take over. Our eyes stay on him. And he will provide the overflow in all things.